Let's start with Graham. This is actually a chapter six concept. Uh, Graham's law says the property of gas A over the property of gas B equals the inverse of the molar masses. So this can, uh, this works, properties that work here are amount, amount of something, uh, rate works, time works, uh, I think there's one more, I don't remember right now. But those definitely work here as properties, so those are possible properties. And so the easy thing is, and you know it's this kind of problem, when they give you, usually they'll give you one property, if you know the molecules, you know, by the way, what's M, capital M here is? Molar mass, not molarity. If it's a gas, capital M is uh, molar mass. If it's a liquid, capital M is molarity. All right, so usually they'll give you the two molecules. That means you know the right-hand side, if you know the molecules. Then they'll give you one of these properties, and you need to know the other. So the main thing you'll notice, if they give you two molecules, and a property, it's a Graham's Law question. There's no other way about it. Okay? So if you have two molecules, they're gases, it's a Graham's Law question. Uh, it, it could, the only way it could be something else if it's a Dalton's Law question, but there they'll give you things like partial pressure, or gra grams of something, that sort of thing. Alright, so in this case, the only thing you need to remember, that exception, is time. Okay, so you have, if they give you time of, say, a fusion of A and time of a fusion of B, that's the only thing that gives this sort of equation. And I'd say in most cases, we won't give you that, we just want you to remember it. So you just need to remember for time. For everything else, amount, for rate, I think there's one more you can look up in your book. For those, oh, distance. Amount, rate, and distance, it's the top one. The exception is time, where uh, it's not the inversion of the molar masses is the direct molar masses. That's Graham's Law. Hopefully you can feel that as a direct plug and chug sort of question. For the other one, uncertainty, now this is a chapter 8 question. This is definitely plug and chug. If you can handle that, usually people love that, that's this kind of question. So usually it's written as change in x times a change in momentum is greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. Or sometimes you'll see an h bar over 2. But I'll just write it how your book does. What you want to do when you see that, don't let it scare you. You want to rewrite it as follows. Change in x times mass times change in velocity, because momentum is mass times velocity, equals h over 4 pi. So just change it to equal sign. You're much better off if you do that. Now, you're good to go. I'm going to put a little star by all the constants. H is going to be a constant. 4, obviously, is a constant. Pi is a constant. Okay? Now, these things here, mass is usually given. Mass is usually, we're talking about what type of particle? Anybody know? Electron. So it's like a 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31st, that number. That has to be in kilograms. Okay? So that means there's only two things left. A distance. So something in meters, this will be in meters, if not, change it to meters. And the velocity should be in meters per second. So that means they're either going to give you the distance and ask you for velocity or vice versa. They'll give you the velocity and ask for distance. That's it. There's sometimes an extra factor here. Sometimes you'll see in a question a percentage accuracy given. If you see a percent accuracy, that has to go with either the distance or the velocity, okay? It's going to go with the one that's given. So, for example, if the distance is, say, 5 meters, the accuracy, the percent, must be multiplied by the meters, okay? Another way to write that, if you want to just stick it in the formula, put the percent right in here. Just multiply by the percent. It's in the formula, okay? It's what that delta means. The delta essentially means a percent accuracy. So you change it to a fraction, so it's 55%, you change it to 0.55 and multiply it in there. Okay? 
So that's that. You're usually, for electrons, going to get a very small answer, extremely small answer. If you don't, you've messed up. If it's something like a baseball or a bowling ball, it's going to be a... Oh, uh, uh, sorry, I said that backwards. You're going to get a very big answer. Sorry, very big. Scratch out small and write big. You're going to get a very big answer for electrons, very small answer for things like bowling balls or uh, tennis balls, that sort of thing. I'll leave that up there for a second. You're still popping. So that's a, very much a plug and chuck. All right, now let's get to the wave functions. Uh, let me try to do my best with wave function stuff. There's two categories, the 2D category, so 2D. That's called a particle in a box. What that is, is we have this graph. So every particle has a wave function. That's what uh, de Broglie tells us. And so this just takes on some math for that. So we're saying every particle, say an electron, flies like a wave, up and down, sinusoidal. So we just want to graph that. But we call that function psi of x. Instead of f of x, we call it psi of x. So we're going to graph psi of x versus x. And x starts at the origin, 0. And then we're going to say this goes up to L, which is what we call the length of the box. And to make this graph look more box-like, we draw a line right there. It's meaningless except to make it look more like a box. OK, so this line here on the right-hand side has no meaning besides making this look like a box. Then all you do is graph this thing. So. The lowest energy one looks like this. This is the n equals 1 2D wave function. The next one will look like this. This is the n equals 2 wave function. Let's see if I can zoom out a little more. And the next one, and you'll see pictures in your book if you want to see this. Last one looks like this. Okay, so some key notes. So this is n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. N is your principal quantum number that you've seen before. Your quantum numbers, that's N. I guess we'll do quantum numbers while we're on this as well. So this N, same N. The formula you really want to remember, one of your key formulas is nodes equals N minus 1. When I say nodes, I mean internal nodes. So notice here, there is no place where the wave function crosses the axis in the middle. So there's zero nodes, because 1 minus 1 is 0. Here, n is 2, so 2 minus 1 is 1. So here we're going to have uh, one node. And here's the node right here. Right there in the middle is the node. So n minus 1, that's the node. Now for the third one here, n equals 3, we're going to have 3 minus 1 are two nodes. So 1, 2. That's where our two nodes are. So we have two nodes. The thing mathematically about a node, a node is where the wave function equals zero. Essentially where the wave function crosses the x-axis is a node. Okay? So that's some of the very basics about it.